Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I'm Dr. Vibhadaman from Terry. Today we are going to talk on module shooting under micropropagation. This is under the paper on plant biotechnology and crop improvement. Now, what we are going to learn today is what are the different methods of shoot multiplication? What are the advantages and disadvantages of following different methods? How the media and growth regulators play an important role? And what are the do's and don'ts while multiplying shoots? Shoot multiplication decides on the success of micropropagation to quite an extent. We don't accept a micropropagation protocol unless and until we have three to four fold multiplication every month because otherwise you will not have the required number of plants produced. Now it depends on what is your ultimate objective and the plant species with which you are dealing with. Different species they have different morphogenic potential different kind of explants which may become available for micropropagation purposes and so on. There are three main methods of shoot multiplication. One is regeneration from the callus, direct adventitious bud formation and forced axillary branching. You have already learned that each plant cell has capacity to form a complete plant, a property called totipotency. All living organisms, all plants, they start their life from a single cell called zygote. That cell divides, redivides, and then differentiates. And that's how tissues are formed and they assume different functions. But then, if we can induce de differentiation, if we can make it forget what it was, and that de differentiated mass of cells, that is called callus. And each cell of the callus has capacity to form a complete new plant again. So you can imagine that starting from a small tissue, a small piece, how many plants can you produce? So it's a very powerful method that you define the media for inducing callusing and thereafter you make it differentiate into shoot buds again. The only problem with this method is that in callus, the cells divide so fast that many a times the entire chromosome, all the chromosomes, they are unable to divide at the same pace or sometimes a portion of the chromosome is not included. A portion of the chromosome gets replicated twice. So you may get variability in the plants arising from it. In many species such as date palm, there is no other method than through callusing. So we are following that method. The callus there again is of very slow growing type and it takes many months, many passages for it to get established. And there you actually leave callus. It's so slow growing that you see it after three months what is happening to it. But in most species, the callus is very fast growing. You induce callusing on oxygen containing media and thereafter you shift it to a media which is high in cytokinin. Now regeneration from the callus can take place in two ways. One is shoot bud regeneration and this is what is depicted in this photograph and you can also have somatic embryogenesis that the cell get transformed into a embryo like structure. What you will observe over here is that the cell gets transformed into a bipolar structure something similar to the embryos which are formed during seed germination. So there are different stages of embryo formation and over here that is what the cell is undergoing. Somatic embryogenesis is considered to be a safer way for cloning purposes for two reasons. One is that there is a threshold in the cell itself that only the diploid cells will form somatic embryos. This is true for most species but not all. And the second is that it is a bipolar structure. So therefore, there is direct connection between the shoot and the root. So therefore, 
all those problems which you face many a times you face in tissue culture or cutting raised plants that there is no direct connection between the shoot and the root that is overcome in somatic embryos. The other advantage of somatic embryogenesis is that you can produce it in bioreactors. Of course, you have learned about bioreactors in the chapter on organogenesis. So, large number of plants can be produced, large number of embryos can be produced. You don't require a separate rooting stage. And another concept was that these embryos, we can encapsulate them in rich food, like something to replace endosperm. And thus, these can be used just as the embryo or the seeds which we use. However, this is still more of a concept. We have not commercialized it. We succeeded in encapsulating. All those things have happened, but to use them as seed on large scale, that still needs to be researched upon. Promising technology, but as I said earlier, that we need to do more research. As there, the reproducible protocols for many of the important species are yet to be developed. The other major problem in the technology remains that embryos are at different stages of development. And embryo induction medium is different from the embryo maturation media. So what happens is that your embryos are arising all the time. You don't know when to transfer that callus on embryo maturation phase. So some of the embryos will go waste, which are very small. And the callus, which still can form more embryos, but uh, that way you are transferring it to the different media. In the chapter on organogenesis, you have learned in which direction research is going on. That is what once we succeed in getting results in synchronizing embryo formation, then the practical applicability of somatic embryogenesis for clonal propagation is bound to go up. The other is that these embryos, although they grow till the maturation stage, but when we transfer them out, their survival is very low. So that still remains a problem. And the other, which also is a problem with the shoot bud regeneration is that the intervening callus phase many a times induces offshoots or variability, so which is not acceptable in clonal propagation. But as I said earlier, by choosing the right concentration of auxin and cytokinin comparatively on the lower side, you can overcome this particular drawback of reducing, of drawback of variability by reducing induction of uh, abnormal embryos. The callus cells, by changing the growth regulator, can give rise to adventitious shoots. The, again, these shoots, they arise in very large numbers. You can separate them from the callus and then transfer to media with different composition for further growth. And then individual shoot is then taken for rooting and then transplanted. Again, these shoots, since they are arising from the callus, they may not be uniform. But what we also try to do, and you should realize that this is a very powerful tool for generating variation in species with very narrow genetic base. So each plant which you produce, you can then multiply it through axillary branching method. So you have multiple copies of similar kind. So for example, like banana has very narrow genetic base, what is being used. There are particular diseases like fusarium or so uh, wilting disease and so on. So from where can you induce variability? So one possibility is that you treat this callus with mutagens, you will get variability. And then each plant, you produce multiple copies and test them for the desirable trait. So this is another technology which you are combining a particular technique of adventitious bud formation with intervening callus phase or inter callus phase giving rise to somatic embryos for inducing variability.
And once you have the plant with desirable traits, that can be multiplied through vegetative propagation. Adventitious budding has its own advantages as callus can be multiplied indefinitely. There is usually no loss of morphogenic potential and you can use it for three years, four years kind of thing. Large number of shoot buds can be regenerated and for many species this is the only method, say date palm. Now the disadvantage is that the clonal uniformity many a times is questionable which of course you can convert it into your advantage if you want to induce variability and in that case you also in put mutagens into the media so as to produce variability in those plants. So now we come to the method which is most commonly used in tissue culture that is the axillary branching. In case of axillary branching the nodal explants with axillary and auxiliary buds present, they are put on the media. Now initial bud break is very simple because explant also has a lot of stored material, endogenous growth regulators and so on. And depending on the species, we either reduce the explant tissue gradually over two or three passages or if we are lucky and we have defined the media, after the first shoot is developed after the first bud break, you can actually remove the mother explant. Axillary branching is most akin to conventional propagation. That is what you do in cutting. You remove the apical tip, you induce the lower end to root and you make one of the nodes show bud break. In this case, what we do, we have single node explants. We give growth regulators that favor shoot growth which shows bud break as well as you maintain right concentration of inorganic and organic salts so that the shoot keeps on growing. So this way you can get large number of shoots which can then be put for rooting purposes. Due to the continuous presence of cytokinin in the media, the shoot developed from the axillary bud present on the nodal cuttings at the time of culture develops further axillary buds which grow directly into shoots. And this process can be repeated several times and the explant gets transformed into cluster of branches. We transfer it to the fresh media largely because what happens in the culture media after two to three weeks it gets depleted in the major salts as well as there is general healing process. So the cut end gets sealed. So it will no longer absorb nutrients. What you need to be careful in axillary branching method is that due to the continuous availability of cytokinin in the media, many a times adventitious buds also start arising. So you want to distinguish between axillary and auxiliary at each passage, discard the adventitious buds and only take the axillary one forward. The method is initially slower because you may get maybe three shoots in every three to four weeks, but then the three will become nine in the following and nine will become 27 in the third passage. So therefore with each passage, the number of shoots will keep on increasing and the method really speaking is not really at a disadvantageous position compared to the number of shoots you can get from adventitious budding or through somatic embryogenesis. So you can still touch upon the same numbers through an axillary branching method. It's most reliable method in terms of genetic uniformity of the micropropagated plants and thus the most favored method for in vitro clonal propagation of plants. But cannot be applied to all species. Like what do you do in species like date palm? So in date palm, except for the apical meristem, you don't have these axillary buds present. So over there, you don't want to destroy the plant by taking the apical meristem and therefore over there, the method followed is that of chimeric. It's the safest method when you're dealing with chimeric plants because here it is not from a single cell but it is from the bud 
and buds they have the same genetic makeup as the apical bud and therefore there is no danger of breaking of chimera apart from different methods of getting shoots and followed by rooting and so on scientists have also got interested in developing the in vitro storage organs which act as propagules in many species how do you multiply potato you take the tuber and you put the suppressed region or nodes where you can get shoot formation so that is the way you vegetatively propagate potato how do you propagate ginger you use rhizomes how do you propagate gladiolus you take combs bulbs and lilium and so on so these storage organs they can also be induced in culture conditions microtubers in potato this is a multi dollar industry today initially when uh, many years back there was a concept of true potato seed which was introduced but the seed size in case of potato is very small so it is not very applicable so thereafter it was why not to multiply plants by tissue culture so the technology developed today is that the plants are developed by tissue culture and thereafter we take them in hydroponic culture so from each plant you can get large number of microtubers and microtubers are continuously harvested at 8 mm stage so there are large number of companies who practically everyone who is into potato business they have set up tissue culture as well as hydroponic facilities for large scale production of microtubers so then the microtubers which are continuously harvested they are then given to primary farmers for going from microtuber to mini tuber stage and then mini tubers are given to farmers for large scale cultivation best method for introduction of new varieties into the country best method to give plants or disease free planting material to the farmers so the processing industries are also ensured of getting the quality raw material for their factories similarly in case of ginger rhizomes have been inducted because otherwise what happens is that if you multiply ginger by tissue culture or potato by tissue culture the plants are very weak compared to the conventional those raised by the conventional propagules so your yields get reduced so if you don't want to compromise on those then it is that you go for in vitro procedures in vitro storage organ production so it has been successfully done rhizomes in ginger have been produced gladiolus comlet production bulbulets in lilium the added advantage of using tissue culture technology for these is first of all you can produce very large number of plants usually these storage organs are produced in dark with high sucrose but at the same time the light electricity cost gets reduced you don't have to subculture them repeatedly and thereafter you produce very large number of disease free plants what you'll notice over here that in all these cases your storage organs are underground and any storage organ which is underground will attract lot of microbes while it is being propagated so over here everything is done under aseptic conditions so supply of disease free planting material which is the major objective of micro propagation is achieved well i'll also like to discuss with you it about a species where micro propagation has been e- extremely successful and it has brought revolution in the country i'm sure uh, you must have observed that the quality of banana is has tremendously improved in the country it's the size of the fruit otherwise availability and so on and you'll be surprised that all this has been possible through tissue culture tissue culture in case of banana which was introduced about a decade ago that's the time we started doing tissue culture of course in other countries it was done even earlier so 
the technology is through auxiliary branching. So once you get the cultures, they are tested for known viruses or when you establish cultures. So whatever viruses of banana are known in the country, that is what we test the explant for. Once it's established that they are disease free, simultaneous, uh, we also do DNA fingerprinting of the mother uh, explant from the where we have excised the explant or the, we just take tissue from the leaves of the explant and we keep it with us so that we can compare the end product and plants which have been produced by tissue culture. It's propagated through axillary branching. You produce large number of plants. Banana is comparatively susceptible in terms of inducing offshoots and therefore we don't go beyond seven or eight subcultures. And thereafter, they all are put for rooting and then transplanted. What is the advantage? You know the quality of each and every plant which is produced by tissue culture. What happens in nature? Of course, it's not that our friends, farmers, they have done a lot of work. They also select which plant is giving better results, which plant is giving them fruit of desirable quality and quantities so that they get profit. But at the most, they get three suckers, three or four suckers from each plant. So each year they can go from one to four, but over here it is one to million. So that is how one was able to produce large number of plants of the selected clones by tissue culture technology. And in spite of the fact that we are keeping multiplication cycles low, as low as seven, it is still profitable. The plantlets are being sold for almost anywhere from 10 to 15 rupees a plant uh, in bulk, of course. And when they are given, they come with quality of assurance, both in terms of virus-free nature as well as clonal fidelity. So you have learned about micropropagation, the way we can multiply shoots, but what are the factors affecting micropropagation? First of all, it's the culture media. What is it? What salts are we giving to the growing shoot, micro shoot? What kind of growth regulators are given? Because they determine both the rate of multiplication and the chances of getting offshoots. Largely, we concentrate on using lower concentration because lower the concentration is, you do compromise in terms of multiplication, but you also ensure that the offshoots don't arise. There is no relationship between the requirements of the plant outside versus what it requires in cultures. So tissue culture, it's more of an art. You start with broad categories, low salt, medium salt, and high salt, and then you decide on what kind of media constituents the plant, the growing culture is requiring. MS media is most widely used, but it is not universal. For woody species, we also use different concentrations of MS. We reduce salts, both major, minor. We play with the vitamins. We decide on the appropriate concentration. We also bring complicated growth adjuvants such as coconut milk, potato extract, and so on into the media, and that determines the growth rate. The growth regulators, as I said, they play a very important role. For shooting, we require cytokinin, but it is not a cytokinin. It can be a combination. It's surprising that many species, they require both BAP and kinetin. There are species which grow best on thiodiazuron, 2IP, and so on. So for different species, there are different requirements. Some species, they also require auxin along with the cytokinin. And it is dictated by the endogenous level as well. So the plant also have capacity to synthesize these growth regulators while in culture and outside. And that determines what is to be given 
exogenously. Gelling agent again plays a very important role. We largely use agar in tissue culture because of its ready availability as well as the price tag. Agar gel is much better, but then in terms of uh, determining any infection because it's very, very clear gel, but then that may introduce hyperhidricity in the shoots. So thus, you largely use agar or combination of agar and agar gel for many species or agar gel depending on the requirement of the species. We don't favor liquid media largely because of aeration problem in the growing tissue. And further, hyperhidricity is far greater in liquid media followed by agar gel than on agar media. So different concentrations of agar can be used, but again 0.8 is the most commonly used concentration. pH of the media again plays a very important role. We normally choose 5.8 because at this pH, most of the salts, they remain available to the plant for growth as well as media solidifies properly. I like to mention that sometimes when you add chemicals like 2IP, the pH of the media immediately changes. pH of the media might change after autoclaving as well. And thus, if you face any problem in solidification of agar, please check the pH. The other thing you should be careful about is that pH of the media also changes while the cultures are growing. So that's one of the reasons that you have to keep on changing the media or take them to the fresh media repeatedly. The conditions in which cultures are incubated are again extremely important because it's temperature, light. I won't say humidity because humidity you are taking care in the closed wilds. So both temperature and light, they are to be controlled carefully. As I said earlier, that culture room is completely closed. That you don't have even a window. It's the door which opens into the clean area. So therefore, whatever you are giving is artificial. So your light intensity should be adequate to induce photosynthesis if possible, keep them green and make them grow. At the same time, it's expensive. Electricity is a major cost in a tissue culture company. So therefore, you restrict use of light to minimum. The other thing is that this also, the lighting also require, induces heating. And therefore, it is advisable to switch on the lights during night when temperatures are comparatively lower. But maintain photo period and the right light intensity. In most tissue culture labs, 8 hours day is adequate, but it varies from 8 to 16 hours. And intensity is about 3000 lux. But it may vary from species to species, so that needs to be tested. Temperature, again, I have mentioned earlier that you don't want any fluctuation. So in incubation room, tolerance level is plus minus 2 degrees centigrade. Most species grow at 25 degrees centigrade, but that is not optimal for all. And depending on the species, temperature can be anywhere from 15 to 35 degrees centigrade. And we achieve that either in incubators or by changing if you have more growth rooms, then you dedicate a growth room to a particular species. So in this module, you have learned how large number of shoots can be produced by tissue culture technology in culture. What precautions are to be taken while we multiply shoots so as to ensure that they remain clonally uniform and we meet with the objective of producing mirror images of the mother plant or true to type plants. The shoots, they must be prepared that they can be rooted very well and then taken to the next stage of rooting and transplantation. So hope you have enjoyed 
this particular talk and would like to take tissue culture as a career.